Welcome back to ABA Chapter Chat. Um, today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the foundations of applied behavior analysis. Oh, very exciting. We're going to be cracking open the first chapter of behavior analysis and learning. Okay. And uh, really pulling out the core concepts that make this field tick. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's amazing how much this chapter lays out like the the groundwork for everything we do as ABA professionals, yeah. like revisiting the blueprint of our practice. Exactly. So let's start with the very basics. Okay. What exactly is behavior analysis? Right. You know, it's it seems like it's more than just observing people, right? You're absolutely right. It's uh yeah. It goes beyond just watching what people do. Okay. It's a scientific approach to understanding the relationship right. between behavior and the environment. Okay. And really, most importantly, it's about how we can influence behavior okay. by changing environmental factors. Okay. So it's about identifying those cause and effect relationships yeah. and using that knowledge to create change. <laughs> the book mentions this really interesting study with seagulls okay. that I think really illustrates this. Right. Can you break that down for us? Sure. Let's say you see a flock of seagulls on the beach. Okay. You might assume they're there because of all the people. Right. But a behavior analyst wouldn't just assume. Yep. They would test that idea by manipulating the environment. Okay. In this case, researchers presented food on the beach only when people weren't present. Oh, interesting. Guess what happened? I'm guessing the seagulls started showing up. Yeah. Even when there were no beachgoers around. Exactly. It turned out the food, oh, wow. not the people, was the real driver of their behavior. Okay. That's a perfect example of how behavior analysis helps us uncover the true causes of behavior. Yeah, it's like being a detective looking for clues to solve the mystery of why someone's yeah. doing what they're doing. That's a great analogy. Now, you might be thinking, well, okay, so we're looking for causes and effects. Mm -hmm. But behavior isn't always that simple, is it? Right. Can you be right? That's where conditioning comes in, right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've heard that word thrown around a lot. Right. I'm not always sure what it means. Well, conditioning is all about learning. Okay. It's about how our experiences shape our behavior. Mm -hmm. The chapter focuses on two main types. Okay. Respondent conditioning, also known as classical conditioning. Right. An operant conditioning. Okay, so respondent conditioning. Mm -hmm. That's the one with Pavlov's dogs, right? You got it. Bell rings, dog drools. Exactly. Yeah. It's all about those automatic responses we have to certain stimuli. Okay. Think about uh, how your mouth might water when you smell your favorite food cooking. Yes. That's respondent conditioning at work. So a neutral stimulus, like the sound of a bell, right. gets paired with something that naturally causes a response like food. Mm -hmm. And over time, that neutral stimulus alone mm -hmm. yeah. can trigger the response. Exactly. And it's not just about drooling dogs. Responding conditioning is behind a lot of our emotional reactions. Okay. Our likes and dislikes. Interesting. Even our fears. Oh, okay. Think, think about phobias. Yeah. If someone has a phobia of spiders. Right. It's likely because they've had a negative experience with a spider in the past. Yeah. Now, even the sight of a spider can trigger an intense fear response. So it's not just about physical reactions like salivating. It's also about how we learn to feel about things. Exactly. And this is really important for ABA professionals because it helps us understand why some behaviors happen and how to address them. Okay. So, for example, if we're working with a child who has a phobia, hmm. we might use techniques like systematic desensitization right. to help them gradually overcome their fear. So that's where you slowly introduce them to the feared object or situation right. while teaching them relaxation techniques. Precisely. It's about creating new positive associations right. to replace the negative ones. Interesting. Now, operant conditioning, on the other hand, is all about consequences. Okay, so that's where rewards and punishments come into play. Right. It's about understanding how the consequences of our actions okay. influence whether we repeat those actions in the future. Okay. Think about a child who throws a tantrum mm -hmm. and gets their parents' attention. Right. Even if that attention is negative, yeah. it can still reinforce the tantrum behavior. Because the child is getting what they want attention. Yeah. Yes. Even if it's not the kind of attention the parents intended. Exactly. And that's why it's so important for ABA professionals to carefully analyze yeah. the contingencies at play, mm -hmm. we need to figure out what's actually reinforcing a behavior right. before we can effectively change it. It seems like understanding both respondent and operant conditioning yes. is crucial for working in ABA. Absolutely. They're two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Two fundamental processes that shape our behavior. Speaking of shaping behavior, 
The chapter introduces this big idea from Skinner. Okay. Called selection by consequences. Right. Is this like Darwin's natural selection, mm -hmm. but for behavior? You're on the right track. Skinner argued that selection by consequences is a universal principle okay. that operates at multiple levels. Interesting. It's not just about individuals learning from their experiences. Right. It's about how entire species and even cultures oh, wow. evolve over time. So it's not just about a kid learning to say, please, to get a cookie. Right. It's about how those behaviors that lead to positive outcomes mm -hmm. become more common within a group. Yeah. Whether it's a family, a community, even an entire society. Exactly. Think about something like table manners. Okay. Burping at the dinner table might have been totally acceptable in some ancient societies. Right. But over time, as social norms changed, yeah. those who exhibited more polite behaviors probably experienced greater social acceptance. Interesting. And that subtly shaped the survival yeah. of those table manners within the culture. So even something as seemingly arbitrary as table manners Ex can be explained through this lens of selection by consequences. Precisely. And what's fascinating is that this principle applies to so many aspects of human behavior. Oh, wow. From language development mm -hmm. to social interactions mm. to even the evolution of our values and beliefs. Wow. It really highlights how powerful consequences are yeah. in shaping who we are and how we behave. Mm. It's making me realize how much more there is to learn mm. about behavior analysis. Right. It's not just a set of techniques. Yeah. It's a whole new way of thinking about the world. I couldn't agree more. And mm. that's what makes it so exciting. We're yeah. constantly discovering new ways to apply these principles to improve people's lives. Well, I'm definitely hooked. I'm ready to dive deeper yeah. into the specifics of respondent and operant conditioning. Sounds good. I feel like this is one of those concepts that sounds simple on the surface, mm -hmm. but gets really fascinating when you start digging deeper. You're absolutely right. Respondent conditioning. Yeah. You might also hear it called classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning. Right. Is all about those seemingly automatic responses we have to certain things in the world. Yeah. It's like our brains are constantly making these lightning fast connections, learning to anticipate what's coming next based on our past experiences. It's like when you smell your favorite food cooking. Yes. And your mouth starts watering even before you see the food itself. Exactly. Or think about how certain songs can evoke vivid memories and emotions. Mm -hmm. That's respondent conditioning at work. Wow. But it's not just about pleasant experiences. Right. Think about phobias. If yeah. you have a fear of spiders, it's likely because you've had a negative experience with a spider in the past. Yeah. Now, even the sight of a spider or maybe just the thought of a spider right. can trigger that intense fear response. Oh, okay. So help me break this down. Okay. So we start with a reflex. Yeah. An automatic response to a stimulus. Mm -hmm. Like in the book, they give the example of a puff of air making you blink. Right. That's unlearned and automatic, right? Precisely. The puff of air is the unconditioned stimulus. Okay. And the blink is the unconditioned response. Okay. It's a built-in connection, no learning required. Okay. Now imagine we introduce a neutral stimulus. Okay. It's something that doesn't naturally cause you to blink. Like saying the word paper wouldn't make someone blink on its own. Right. But here's where things get interesting. Yeah. If we pair that neutral stimulus paper with the puff of air mm -hmm. over and over again. And we say paper and immediately follow it with a puff of air. Exactly. Okay, I'm starting to see where this is going. Exactly. The word paper, which was previously meaningless in this context, right. starts to predict the puff of air. Mm -hmm. It becomes a conditioned stimulus. Right. And because it's now linked to the puff of air, yeah. it can elicit the blink response all on its own. So now, even without the air puff, just hearing the word paper can make someone blink. Exactly. It's like our brains are constantly creating these little prediction machines yeah. based on our experiences. That's a great way to put it. And these prediction machines are running all the time, wow. shaping our reactions to the world in mm. ways we often don't even realize. Think about advertising. Companies are masters at using respondent conditioning to influence our purchasing decisions. Right. They pair their products with images and music mm -hmm. that evoke positive emotions. Yeah. 
hoping that we'll start associating those good feelings with their brand. Like those commercials with the adorable puppies and the keki jingles. Exactly. They're not just selling a product, they're selling a feeling. Exactly. They're trying to tap into our pre-existing emotional responses. Right. And link them to their products. And mm -hmm. it's not just about making us feel good. Right. They also use fear and anxiety to sell us things like insurance or security systems. Right. It makes you realize how much of our behavior is influenced by these subtle, often subconscious associations. Mm -hmm. It's like respondent conditioning is operating behind the scenes, shaping our preferences and aversions without us even being aware of it. That's why it's so crucial for ABA professionals to understand these principles. Right. We need to be aware of how respondent conditioning might be playing a role in the behaviors we're seeing, especially when those behaviors seem resistant to change. So how does this apply to working with clients. Yeah. I know we talked about systematic desensitization for phobias. Right. But what are some other ways that understanding respondent conditioning can inform our practice? Well, for starters, it helps us recognize that some behaviors are elicited automatically regardless of consequences. Okay. Trying to modify those behaviors through reinforcement or punishment alone mm -hmm. might not be effective. Okay. We need to address those underlying conditioned responses. So, for example, if a child is having a meltdown because they've learned to associate a certain place right. with a negative experience. Mm -hmm. Simply punishing them for the meltdown isn't going to address the root of the problem. Exactly. We need to help them create new positive associations with that place. Okay. It might involve slowly and systematically introducing them to the environment while pairing it with reinforcing activities. Mm -hmm. Or it might involve teaching them coping skills to manage their anxiety when they're in that situation. It seems like understanding respondent conditioning can also help us avoid unintentionally reinforcing certain behaviors. That's a great point. Imagine a child who throws a tantrum every time they're told no. Okay. If the parent gives into the tantrum to avoid a scene, right. even though they're intending to set a limit, mm -hmm. they might actually be strengthening that tantrum behavior through respondent conditioning. Oh, wow. The child is learning that the tantrum is an effective way to get what they want, yeah. even if the parent is trying to do the opposite. Wow. That's a great example of how these principles can operate in subtle ways. Mm -hmm. It's like we need to be detectives constantly looking for those hidden connections that might be driving behavior. Precisely. And that's what makes behavior analysis so fascinating. Yeah. It's about keeling back the layers, mm -hmm. understanding the complex interplay of factors that shape our actions, right. both internal and external, both conscious and unconscious. We've covered a lot of ground today, but there's still so much more to explore. I'm already thinking about how I can apply these insights to my work. That's great. Before we wrap up this part, is there anything else you want to highlight about respondent conditioning? I think the key takeaway is this right. respondent conditioning is happening all around us all the time. Mm -hmm. It's shaping our emotional reactions, our preferences, even our sense of self. Right. By understanding these principles, we can gain a deeper understanding of human behavior yeah. and develop more effective strategies for creating positive change. Well, I'm definitely feeling more conditioned to be an effective ABA professional after this deep dive yes. into respondent conditioning. But I know we have one more part to go. We do. What's next on our journey through behavior analysis and learning? We're going to tackle some of the bigger picture questions, like the challenges of incorporating private events into behavior analysis okay. and the exciting new directions the field is heading in. It's amazing how much ground this first chapter covers. And now it feels like we're moving into a territory where things get a bit more complex, a bit more philosophical yeah. even. The chapter kind of delves into some of the challenges and new directions facing the field of behavior analysis. Right. And I'm really curious to hear your take on these. It's definitely a section that sparks a lot of debate and discussion. One of the biggest challenges we grapple with is how to incorporate private events, you know, thoughts, feelings, sensations into a science that's traditionally focused on observable behavior. Right. Because we all have those inner experiences, but they're not something someone else can directly see or measure. It makes me think of that old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. That's a great way to put it. And it gets to the heart of the matter. Behavior analysts don't deny the existence of those private events. We acknowledge that they're real and that they can influence behavior. But we also recognize that they're ultimately behaviors themselves subject to the same principles of learning and reinforcement as any outward behavior. So instead of seeing thoughts and feelings as the root cause of behavior, we're trying to understand how those internal experiences are also shaped by environmental factors, by 
past experiences by the same principles of learning that we've been discussing. Exactly. It's like trying to understand the whole story of a person, not just the chapter that's visible on the surface. We're asking questions like, what are the environmental triggers that might be eliciting these thoughts and feelings? How have past experiences shaped their internal dialogue? What are the potential consequences, both internal and external, that might be maintaining these patterns of thinking and feeling? It sounds like a real detective job, piecing together all those different clues to understand what's really going on. That's a great way to think about it. It requires careful observation, creative thinking, and a willingness to dig deeper to understand the individual's unique history and context. But I can imagine some people might find this approach a bit limiting, maybe even a bit cold. Like, are we reducing the richness of human experience down to just behaviors, just a series of inputs and outputs? It's not about reducing human experience, but about finding a scientifically sound way to understand and address those internal experiences that are causing distress or interfering with a person's life. So instead of getting bogged down and trying to directly manipulate or control thoughts and feelings, which can be incredibly challenging, we're focusing on changing the environmental factors and learning experiences that are shaping those internal events. That's the idea. And that's where the integration of behavior analysis with other fields like neuroscience becomes really exciting. Speaking of new directions, the chapter touches on some cutting edge science that's changing the way we view the brain itself. The idea that our experiences can literally alter the structure and function of our brains is mind blowing to me. It's truly remarkable. We're moving beyond the traditional view of the brain as a static organ and recognizing its incredible plasticity, its ability to change and adapt throughout our lives. And one of the most fascinating areas of research in this regard is epigenetics. I remember reading about this, the idea that our experiences can actually switch genes on or off, influencing how they're expressed. I was like, our environment is having a direct conversation with our DNA. Precisely. And it's challenging the traditional view of nature versus nurture. It's not a competition, it's a dynamic interplay. The queen bee and worker bee example from the chapter perfectly illustrates this. They have the same DNA, but their vastly different diets lead to completely different outcomes in terms of their behavior and even their physical characteristics. It makes you wonder what other hidden potentials are lurking within our genes waiting to be unlocked by our experiences. It's a thrilling frontier. And it has profound implications for how we understand and approach behavioral challenges. It's not just about modifying behavior. It's about understanding the biological mechanisms that underpin those changes. It seems like the field of behavior analysis is constantly evolving, integrating new discoveries from other fields and expanding its reach. I'm curious, what are some of the most exciting new directions you see emerging? Well, as we've discussed, the integration with neuroscience is opening up incredible new avenues for research and intervention. We're also seeing a growing emphasis on applying behavior analysis to address larger societal issues like sustainability, public health, and even promoting peace and cooperation. Wow, that's truly impressive. It sounds like behavior analysis is moving beyond the individual level to tackle some of the biggest challenges facing humanity. It's an incredibly exciting time to be in this field, and it all goes back to those foundational principles we've been discussing, understanding behavior, its causes, and how it can be changed. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise and passion for behavior analysis. It's been an eye-opening journey through this first chapter. The pleasure has been all mine. It's always inspiring to revisit these core concepts and to see how they continue to shape and evolve the field. And to our listeners, we hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into behavior analysis and learning. We encourage you to continue exploring these ideas, to ask questions, and to see how you can apply these principles to make a positive difference in your work and in the world. Remember, behavior analysis is more than just a set of techniques. It's a way of thinking, a framework for understanding ourselves and the world around us. Keep those brains buzzing, and we'll see you next time on ABA Chapter Chat.